this week, on my personal prayer time, I have been praying for a family whose father was in a devastating motorcycle accident. Now, the family's really grateful that he's even alive, but the road to recovery is going to be long, and the financial worries loom large. I'm also praying for several people who are dealing with life-changing illnesses like cancer and organ transplants, or just pain that wears them down hour by hour and day by day. I'm praying for people who are unemployed and underemployed, who struggle to make ends meet, who worry if their kids are even going to have enough food for dinner tonight. People who go to work every day but can't make ends meet, even though they live frugally. <coughs> and people who can't work because they're disabled. And then their car blows up, or their air conditioning turns off, or they run out of propane for cooking, and there just isn't the money there to fix the problem. I'm praying for a woman this week who's lost three friends this month. I'm also praying for those who've lost aunts and uncles and father-in-laws and dad. This week, a woman became a widow when she woke to find her husband, the father of three, dead in their living room. I pray that that family finds the courage to go on. There are some huge, terrifying giants in the lives of people that we care for. There's times when we feel ready to give up. The obstacles loom large, and it blocks out our view of hope. It seems like the whole world is against us and the only safe place is bad. There are people in this congregation, people that we love, that are at the end of their rope, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And they need to be refreshed with God-infused imagination and to find the hope to take one more little step against the giant threats in their life. David had that infused imagination that gave him a different perspective on the Philistine threat, different than that held by the Israelite armies. For 40 days, <coughs> The Israelites' imagination was dominated by Je Goliath. Goliath was big. Historians don't quite know how big because some texts say 40 cubits and some say 6. But he was big, bigger than all the other men of his age. He was more likely to be taller than 9 feet. And he was descended from the infamous warrior giants of Nephilim, which are first mentioned in Genesis. He wore 150 pounds of armor, and he hefted a 25-pound spear, and he could talk trash better than Mohammed Ali. <laughs> Each day for 40 days, he blasphemed God. He was shooting taunts and insults and threats right across the valley, diminishing the Israelites and increasing the dread. Bible commentator Eugene Peterson describes the valley of Elah at that point as a cauldron in which fear and hate and arrogance have been stirred and cooked for weeks into what is now a volatile and lethal brew. The Israelites had defeated the Philistine armies many times in the past. In fact, in 1 Samuel 7.13 it says, 
that all throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines, and there was peace in the land. But now, the vision of Goliath blocked the remembrance of their history, and they were, as scripture said, dismayed and terrified. David has been off guarding his father's flocks in the hills and in the meadows near Bethlehem. He has been immersed in the largeness of God and the immediacy of God. He has experienced God's presence as he protected his sheep against wild animals, and he's been living in step with God's creation in the green pastures and by the still waters. Peterson says, David's praying and singing, his meditation and adoration had shaped an imagination in him that set each sheep and each lamb, each bear and each lion into something large and vast and robust. Imagination was in God. His imagination was so God-dominated that when he walked into that valley of Elah, he was not infected. He was immune to the Goliath terror that plagued everybody else. Although David alone would be no match for the battle-hardened crack soldier Goliath, David was not alone. He carried a deep trust and confidence in God and an understanding that the battle was the Lord's. David was no match for Goliath, but Goliath was no match for God. The same infected imagination that treated Goliath as important saw David as insignificant. When he arrived there, his eldest brother accuses him of being conceited and coming only to see the specter of battle gore. Saul saw only a boy. Goliath saw him as a stick fit for a, amusing a dog. And then even when Saul agrees to send David into battle, his imagination is again limited by the technology he knows. And he dresses David in heavy armor and gives him a mighty sword. But David stays true to himself, his skill set, and his trust in God, and he rejects the armor in front in favor of his rod and his slingshot. As Israel sat on the brink of losing its identity to the Philistines, David knelt at the brook. It only says in scripture that he chose five smooth stones, but I see him kneeling and looking in the water to find those rocks. Kneeling, even though he wouldn't be able to run. Kneeling, even though he wouldn't be able to see what Goliath was doing. Kneeling and concentrating and waiting for God to show him the right walk, rocks. Kneeling in a posture that's open to God. Now, this kneeling at this kneeling enraged Goliath, and he just spewed hate and anger and rage. Come to me, I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals. But the battle is the Lord's, and so as the giant begins to move, David also runs towards him and loads his sling, releases it, hits the giant on the head, and then God has killed the giant, the giant falls down. When David knelt at that brook, though, the world was bounded on one side by arrogant and bullying people of Philistia, and on the other by the demoralized and anxious people of Israel. David's kneeling opens a third option, a God option. 
God's way, God's salvation. As we try to live our lives as followers of Jesus, there are plenty of times and events that bring us to a point of exhaustion and hopelessness. If there's anything that will shift us from God's dreams for us into a path of destruction, it is fear. Fear is a little dark room where negatives are developed. Yet, we have that option of kneeling at the brook and looking for those five smooth stones. Eugene Peterson, in a different book on spiritual disciplines, called Five Smooth Stones, suggests that the generations of being in the rushing waves of the creek have smoothed the stones, the same as the many years of being in the stream of God's grace have shaped our spiritual traditions. These trusted gifts of God provide us what we need to face the dangerous giants in our life. The United Methodists call these gifts means of grace. And we include such practices as <coughs> prayer, coming to worship, sharing in communion, and works of mercy. These are the smooth stones that we look towards when we need God's help. Being a believer in Christ does not guarantee an accident-free or a pain-free or a totally safe life. Being a believer means that we have faith that in time God will work it all out for good. And that ultimately God's plans will not be thwarted or as one neighbor, who has been through great trials lately, told me, when faith is your base, everything else falls in place. What giants are terrorizing you? As we be prepare to become a two-point charge, and I prepare to become the pastor of two churches, I'm aware of the many worries and concerns that have been raised. And I, the negative voices could dominate and crush our ministries. Or we can rely on our God-dominated imaginations and expect continued growth with God's grace. Knowing that God's hand is at work has never meant that our hands are idle. David knelt. We need a posture that is open to God, a posture of hope and grace. David chose five smooth stones. We look towards our spiritual disciplines and our means of grace to become immersed in that God imagination. There's a saying, courage is fear that has said its prayers. David moved towards the giant and took action. With God's help, we can do the same, even though we become deeply discouraged at times. We are not facing life's challenges alone. The Holy Spirit is with us, and our friends in our congregation surround us. We can move forward one step at a time with confidence in the sense that our hopes are being supported. Laura shared this quote with me earlier this week. God grants God-sized wishes to people with God-shaped hearts. I find a lot of hope in that statement. I find a lot of hope in Laura's faith and in her willingness to face challenges head on and take risks for God. Sometimes impending changes to our ministry frighten us. Some aspects of our modern culture scare us and we can become entrenched in our pews as fear closes in. Our imagination can be overrun by a world focus, and we can be tempted to use the world's tools to fight against the world, fighting hate with hate. Or, as we sang in our opening, we can choose to let God be our fortress, our bulwark never failing. 
Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, wrote that song originally in German, and that's why there's some difficulties in translations. However, the meaning came through loud and clear. If we depend only on our strength, our striving is for nothing. Yet that is not the case because through Jesus Christ, truth will triumph through us. The spirit and gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. The translation coming from King, King James is a little cumbersome, but the message endures. With God, victory over the terrorizing giants, whether personal or communal, is possible. The Holy Spirit can use our witness, and Jesus can provide an example of hard work and humility, and so much can be accomplished for God that is worth talking about. Earlier this week on the MSNBC Nightly News with Brian Williams, there was a story about Lola Jones. She is an Olympic hurdler on the U.S. team. And she's overcome obstacles both on the track and in her life. Early on, Lola's mom was left to raise five children alone. She worked multiple jobs just to feed them. At one low point, they were blessed by the hands-on witness of the Salvation Army, who provided shelter for them. The basement room where the six cots were set up, it was a basement washroom, where the six cots were set up was extremely humble and yet life-sustaining. Lola wished that at now, she could go back in time to that moment and whisper in her mom's ear that it was going to all work out all right. Maybe her mom did hear the whispers of the Holy Spirit and knew that. The story did not say. Lola says, though, that when you fix one small thing at the beginning, it can set you on a winning trajectory. The God's love is no small thing. It is a mighty fortress. It can sustain us when the giants in our life are taking, talking smack and threatening to dominate our imagination. Lord, may we kneel before you and find your gifts in the stream of your grace and use them to conquer all the giants in our life. Let us pray. Loving God, when we are inclined to worry or panic, speak with authority to us. Speak directly through Jesus so that fears may be confronted and our faith reinstated. Through him and in him, let us spend our days and nights with the courage and peace of those who know they are being saved and sustained by your grace. And to you be the glory and praise. Amen.